it announced, by the grace of God, we're starting a new series. Glory to God. The new series is titled, You and the Holy Spirit. And this morning, I'll be taking the subject, subtitled, Between the Natural Man and the Spiritual Man. Between the natural man and the spiritual man. But the series itself is you and the Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege you have given us. The privilege of your life that is flowing in us. Lord, we will never take it for granted. Accept our thanksgiving for it in Jesus' name. Help us this morning as we go into your word. Grant me grace to be able to rightly divide your word of truth unto your people. And grant your people grace to hear. Not just to hear, but to understand, to perceive, and to be able to put to use in the days ahead in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Because the enemy has no part or lot in the remaining part of this service. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Please go with me to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, to anchor the personality of the Holy Spirit, to anchor and show you that the Holy Spirit and you or you are supposed to function not without the Holy Spirit. Let's go to the creation or the beginning of the beginnings. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit has always been there. He has been designed by God to be our helper, our energizer. And without him... The best you can be is be a natural man and not a spiritual man. And that's why I'll be showing you the difference between the natural man and the spiritual man this morning. But let's go first to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. A division is about to take place. And everything that is dark in your life, God will bath light out of them in the name of Jesus. Whatever situation may appear dark in your life, I want you to get ready because I know that God will be doing something new in the name of Jesus. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Hallelujah. The interesting thing is, light always comes out of darkness. Did you hear me? Light was divided out of darkness. So whenever there is darkness in your life, I need you to understand that that is the primary raw material for the light of God to shine forth. So you are not supposed to be afraid of darkness. God is not the author of darkness. 
But whatever situation has positioned, has come into your life, whether by your making or your own making, whether by default or by the result of the works of your hand, whatever darkness that comes into your life, you should rejoice because it will provide an opportunity for God to manifest his power. Is somebody here this morning? He divided the light from darkness. And he saw that it was good. Out of that dark situation, something good will come out. I said, out of that dark marital journey of yours, something good will come out of it. Out of that seemingly dark relationship of yours, something good is coming out of it. He divided the light from the darkness. Glory to God. Verse 5, he called the light day. And the darkness, he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Glory to God. No matter the darkness you may be experiencing, your day is not complete without the light within it. So whenever you are going through a cycle of darkness, for that day to be complete, you ought to experience light. Hallelujah. Let, then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the seas. And thus God made a firmament. He divided the waters which are under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Let's pause for a while. The triune God always functioned together. In other words, we know God is a triune God. God the Father. God the Son or the Word. And then God the Holy Spirit. They always function together. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when the world became void, when the world became shapeless, when the world became empty, God said, God the Father positioned himself, he spoke the word, and because the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep, the moment he said, his Spirit took his word and began to energize and activate his word upon the emptiness and the void that was upon the face of the earth and all that became restored. All that became restored. Hallelujah. All that became restored. Why? Because God the Father spoke the word God the Son, and by the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, order came together. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. For you, the restoration of whatever has become shapeless. Whatever it is in your life that has become shapeless, that is void, that does not make a meaning. I want you to know that God has a plan for it. And because the Godhead were all present with the Spirit of God over and upon the face of the waters, it doesn't matter how dark the darkness is that has filled your life. I need you to understand that it doesn't matter how dark the darkness that has filled your marital journey. It doesn't matter how dark the darkness is that has consumed your career or your professional life. It doesn't matter how shapeless, how formless, and how empty life appears to be because the Holy Spirit of God is here to create something good out of that situation in the name of Jesus. We should have confidence that in that first moment, when God was going to restore order, when he was going to restore peace, when there was going to be a restoration of tangibility upon the void that was upon the face of the earth, the Holy Spirit moved. 
Glory to God. Hallelujah. Please give me Genesis chapter 1. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Let's look at the words of the Bible in a contemporary language. The message translation. Genesis 1-2. Message translation. Look at the way it described the earth. Earth was a soup of nothingness. A bottomless emptiness. An inky blackness. Hallelujah. A soup of nothingness. You may be thinking that my life has become a soup of nothingness. Nothing comes out of it. I try this, it ends in failure. I try this, it ends in failure. I try that, I take up a job, it ends in failure. I'm pushed out, I'm sacked. I start to do a business, all the money goes and disappears into thin air. I can't even account for the capital. You partner with somebody, you end it with fight, cruelty, and enmity because you don't know what happened. Your life may have become a soup of nothingness. It's nothing you try. You just keep meeting with nothingness. You keep meeting with bottomless emptiness, an emptiness that does not cease. Perhaps you are listening to this message and you are here this morning and that may be the description of your situation or of your life. Or it has become an inky blackness. Everything that is written about you is just black. Whenever your story is being written, it's with sadness. Whenever the story of your career is being written, you are rusticated in the university and you couldn't finish it. Oh, you started an online course. You abandoned it halfway. You try to do advanced training and something frustrates it and truncates it. Your life has become an inky blackness. Whenever the pen is put together to write the story of your life, it's not that completed because it has become an inky blackness. I'm here to tell you this morning that there is hope for you. I said there is hope for you. If you will release yourself to the spirit of the almighty God. It says God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. Your life appears to be a watery abyss. It's so watery. There's nothing good to write about your life. But if you will allow the spirit of God to brood over it. I see order and restoration. I say, I see order and restoration coming into your life. In the name of Jesus. With the help of the Holy Spirit in your life, something good is coming out of that nothingness. A new horizon will begin to take shape. And light will shine forth out of the inky blackness of your life. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. If you will surrender to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God was brooding upon the watery surface of the water abyss. There's a need for a total and complete surrender to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're just reading it. And then we saw that after God created an enabling environment for man, he created all the infrastructure man will need. He created the earth in day three. He created all that will make life conducive for the man. Then let's go to verse 26, Genesis 1. Let's consider the creation of man, the spirit man. Listen, friends. Before you came, before you arrive on this side of eternity, everything you will ever need to succeed has been created. Everything. Everything you will ever need. Because that is the pattern of the Almighty God. He created everything and after he saw that everything was good, he says, God spoke. Give it to me in the New King James. Let us let us, the U is caps, talking of a great person, 
us, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let us, New King James Version, let us make man in our image. You see the O caps. Let us, our image. And according to our likeness, oh, our likeness, caps, hallelujah, and let them have dominion. You are created to have dominion. You are created to dominate your world. You are created to rule and to reign, hallelujah. God, when he created you, created you to dominate, hallelujah. Over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 27. So God created man in his own image and in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Look at 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Don't allow no man to push you over. That you are a female version of him does not mean you are an underdog. That you are a woman does not mean that your life must become a doormat that men will trample upon. He created him. You are just the female version of him that he created. Can I have an amen? Can I have an amen? So whether you are a woman or a man, you are created in God's image. He created him in the image of God. You may be a woman, you are created in God's image. Your femininity or your gender does not preclude you from the dominion mandate that God gave man. He created him, the male and female, he created them. You are just a fee version of the male. Can I have an amen? It doesn't make you less in any way, intellectually, emotionally. If anything, you are a strong being. Can I have an amen from the women? You are not a pushover. You are an equal partner. Like every partnership, there must be a leader. Can I have an amen? And you must recognize that leadership so that there can be proper order. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Who is the boss? Who says? Who says? Is God the Father different from God the Son? Is God the Son different from God the Holy Spirit? Is the same God that works all things in all things. They are just different manifestations for different purposes. He says, let us make man in our own image and our likeness. He's a triune God, the same God in three manifestations. Can I have an amen? He made man in his own image. He made him, and then male and female, he created them. Just two different versions because the two of them have different functions and they must complement one another. Can I have an amen? amen? Hallelujah. Man, don't allow your ego to be bruised by your woman. She's of equal opportunity. She's of equal status. He created you both in God's image. She's not supposed to be your doormat. Can I have an amen? You need her to be the best you that God has made. And you also need him to be the best you God has made. Can I have an amen? amen. Verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Hallelujah. 
Let's quickly look at those words, image and likeness. What does it mean? I'm talking of between the natural man and the spiritual man. And I'm leading you somewhere. So we've seen how he created the spirit man. That's what we are looking at in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. He created the spirit man. Hallelujah. The spirit man was created in his image and in his likeness. In God's image, our image and our likeness. Hallelujah. That word image is the Hebrew word shalem. S-E-L-E-M. And it refers to the image as a representation of the deity. Image as a representation. Image as something that is taken out of. Cut out of. You carve out an image out of. A representation of a deity. Image there also means likeness. Shalem also means likeness. That which is a pattern. A model or example of something. He made you spirit man as an example of himself. As an example of the Godhead. As a model of himself. In his image. And the word likeness means demut. D-E-M-U-T. Likeness means demut. In other words, in the similitude of. That which has a similarity or comparison. He made you similar to himself. To be a model of him. To be his representative. To be a model of him. Similar to him. Comparable to him. You are made in his image and in his likeness. Hallelujah. Now listen to this. Let me put those definitions together. So man was made in God's image, Shalem, as his representative. And in his likeness, Demut, in his similitude, similar to him, to model his dominion mandate over God's creation as vice regents. Man was made in God's image as his representative and in his similitude to model his dominion over God's creation here upon the face of the earth. That's who you are. Hallelujah. So when the choir began to sing that you have been made in his image and likeness, I said, these guys have peeped into my notes. To reign upon the earth. He cut you out of himself. Similar to himself. As a model. As a representative of deity. As his representative. And he put you here. To exercise his dominion mandate. Can I have an amen? Is somebody here this morning? Do you understand what God is saying about you? You are his representative. Made in his image, in his likeness, similar to him, comparable to him, as a model, as a representative to exercise his dominion upon the works of his hands. Glory to God. That's who you are. To have dominion. Go with me to Psalm chapter 8. Let's see the exercise. Let's break down and amplify what it means to be his regent, his vice regent upon the face of the earth, his representative, a model of him. Psalm chapter 8. See the position God placed this man whom he created in his image as his representative. Let's read from verse 1. Oh Lord our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Who have set your glory above the heavens? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. May every enemy and avenger of your soul be silenced in the name of Jesus. 
Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. That's what happens when you begin to sing the praise of God. You receive strength from above because his joy shall become your strength. And with that, you are able to speak mysteries and confuse the enemy and silence the avengers and the enemies of your soul. Hallelujah. You must know who you are. Made in God's image, Shalem, and in his likeness, Demut, comparable to him, bearing the fullness of his authority to exercise dominion. Glory to God. No situation will be able to put you under. I said, no situation will be able to put you under. You will silence every avenger and enemy of your soul in the name of Jesus. When the enemy comes at you, the Bible says God will raise up a standard. Look, whatever challenges, whatever darkness, whatever emptiness and contradiction God brings into your life, I want you to know that he's creating an opportunity for light to shine forth. In the name of Jesus, every contradicting situation in your life will become a stepping stone. They will become a stepping stone. They will become an instrument and raw material for light to shine forth in the name of Jesus. How will the world know that you are a carrier of the greater one? When the challenges come and you have the staying power to hang in there and trust God and say, Lord, out of darkness you divided light. This dark situation, you must manifest yourself and your glory. You must exercise and allow me to exercise your dominion mandate so that men may know that you are a God that is alive and well, ruling and reigning in the affairs of men and nations. Shout hallelujah. As a child of God, you are never supposed to run away from any challenge. There are raw materials for the manifestation of God's power. Some of you want to experience the power of God, and yet you run away from problems. Who is there as solution providers? Who is there to solve corruption? Was that not the song you were singing? Who is there to be an agent of righteousness, to rid the nation of corruption, or to rid the nations of the world of corruption, if not you? Romans 8, 19, the earnest expectation of the creature. The whole world is waiting for your manifestation. The dark world is waiting for you, the bearer of light, to shine forth, to show forth the glory of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. I love to solve problems. In my field, there is nothing that scares me. There is no project that scares me, nothing. Because I believe if I don't have the solution, nobody will have the solution. And that's my mindset. Whenever there is a challenge, oh, throw it at me. I'm ready. Glory to God. I'm never scared of challenges. Never scared of problems. Because I know it will only provide an opportunity for the name of God to be glorified. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. From this season, as you embrace the person of the Holy Spirit and understand that you are God's vice regent upon the face of the earth, may the power to overcome manifest in you. In the name of Jesus. Let's move on. We're talking, we're reading verse number three, Psalms chapter eight. We're looking at the position God has placed man. Psalm eight, verse three. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you visit him. Look at this. Verse 5. You have made him a little lower than the angels. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. You are crowned with glory and honor. I say you are crowned with glory and honor. A man that is in honor and does not know it is like the beast of the earth that perishes. Psalm 49 verse 20. 
The man that is in honor, he has crowned you with glory and with honor. Be that word there. There's a man that is in honor that does not understand it. He doesn't know it is like the beast that perish. May your understanding be enlightened today. May your understanding be quickened. May you come to terms that God created you as his vice regent to have dominion upon the face of the earth. In the name of Jesus. We are reading Psalm 8. You have made him a little lower than the angels. Verse 5. That word there in the Hebrew is the word Elohim, not angels. The early translators couldn't comprehend that how can man be just made a little lower than God? So they decided to use angels. Give it to me in the New Living Translation, verse 5. That word is Elohim in the Hebrews. It means God, you have made him a little lower than yourself. You have made them only a little lower than God, G-O-D, and crowned them with glory and honor. That is who you are, bearing a crown of glory and honor. It doesn't matter. You may be bearing a crown of thorns. It's just a matter of time. Hallelujah. Because sometimes without a cross, there is no crown. You have been Heavily capacitated. You have been heavily equipped as your spirit man is equipped to bear the crown. If you are bearing the cross, the cross of suffering, if you are bearing the cross and enduring the pains, they are just for a while. Because sometimes without the cross, there is no crown. Can I have an amen? The only thing that is stopping you from manifest, from enjoying the manifestation of that glory and honor is time. Can I have an amen? And if you can endure the season, it's just a little time. Shout hallelujah. Let's read on verse 6. I made a little lower than God, Elohim. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. And you have put all things under his feet. Hallelujah. Made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. And all things have been put under your feet. Your feet is talking of authority. Everything is under your authority. Everything is under your authority. What are they, verse 7? All sheep, all oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the parts of the seas. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent. Is your name in all the earth. Hallelujah. That's what you have dominion over. Mirror in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. You have dominion over all the works of God. And he has crowned you with glory and with honor. Hallelujah. But you know something? Adam lost that authority. In Genesis chapter 3. But thank God for the last Adam came to restore it to man. Shout hallelujah. Glory to God. He came to restore it. Go with me quickly to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Adam lost that authority. He lost the crown. He lost the glory. He lost the honor due to sin in Genesis 3. But thank God the story didn't end there. Christ has come to regain it back for us. Shout hallelujah. Luke chapter 4. When God, when Christ came to restore it back to us, God took extra precautions so that you will not lose it again. Can I have an amen? What was that precaution? God put everything under Christ's charge. So Christ is now in charge of it and is holding it in trust for you, the church. Shout hallelujah. That is the difference. In the beginning, he gave it directly to man. Man couldn't hold it. Adam couldn't hold it. He lost it to the devil. You cannot match the devil by your own strength and by your own power. But when you receive Christ and with the help of the Holy Spirit, you have full access because he's under the jurisdiction of Christ. 
Can I have an amen? Luke chapter 4, let's read from verse 1. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Can you be led into the wilderness? Or you are only led to glory? Can the Holy Spirit allow a man to be led into evil? Answer yourself. Can I have an amen? Can God allow evil to come upon man? Can God allow it? Hallelujah. So please change your theology. God can. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to meet with beasts. Before he began to rule. Before he began his assignments. And I always tell people, this is subjective. This immediately, after I was pronounced, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He was led into the wilderness. If you are going to be a man or a woman that will fulfill the call of God upon your life, that will fulfill the purposes of God, your wilderness experience awaits you. You can't run away from it. Can I have an amen? In your marriage, you will go through your wilderness experience. It may come at the start of your marriage. Some of you may be from courtship before the marriage. Uh, some of you may be the early part of your marriage. Some of you, after 10 years or after 5 years, you will go through your wilderness experience to make you better. Can I have an amen? If you think all is just going to be rosy, rosy, hallelujah, don't deceive yourself. Glory to God. The same thing in business, the same thing in your academics. Whatever it is you want to do that is worth the while, that is in line with God's will, you must be tested. Can I have an amen? God will allow you to be proved. He will allow the drosses in you, all the mud in you, for diamond to come forth. Many of you are like diamonds in the mud. You need to be shaken off. You are like gold that is filled with ashes. He will pass you through the crucible of life so that every shaft and every impurity in you can, can, can wear off. Can I have an amen? So that true and pure gold can come forth. But you know what? The believers of these days don't like to hear that message. They're not interested in such a message. But that is the reality. Jesus had to endure the cross. He had the power to call down legion of angels and kill everybody. But he says, suffer it so to be so for now. Can I have an amen? So he was led, tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. The devil is not going to come to you when you are strong. It's when he knows you are vulnerable. It's in your vulnerable moments. When everything is going well and rosy, the devil will be hailing you. Hey, ride on now. Ride on now. Ride on now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Are you with me this morning? When everything is going on and people are cheering you, cheerleaders, they are cheering you. Hey, you have friends. A man's gifts will make room for him, isn't it? When you have plenty, you have friends, multiple friends around you. They are cheering you on. Hey, ride on, brother. Hey, ride on. Your house is filled with men. Go and ask those political appointees. Can I have an amen? Their homes are like Mecca. The day they are removed from that, I wonder how the IGP of police will be feeling now. Hallelujah. The next day, you won't see, the bed, bed will not even chirp around you. You are wondering, now, is this real or hallelujah? It's only at vulnerable times that the devil comes. When he became hungry, he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He knew he would need bread. He knew. Give me verse 3. He knew. It's when we are vulnerable, the devil comes. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. What should Jesus do if it were you? 
bread, stone, become bread. And show him the power and the son of whom you are. Is that not what you would do? You show him the son of whom you are. You, you are trying me. I will show you. Is that not the way you do? Those who are powerful, a powerful man does not need to show his power. You restrain yourself. This is a temptation. When that's when the thing will enter you, you say, yes, I will deal with you. You don't know who you are talking to. I will show you, I will remove that dress from your neck. What's his name? Inspector. So, in fact, you start carrying your phone. Start calling the IG. Say, please, this man is insulting me. Oh, you don't have power. Empty barrels make the most noise. The man that is full of power, you don't need to show it. Jesus said, he said, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. What did Jesus say? Verse 4, what did he say? It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, by every, when you act irrationally and based on the spur of the moment, you may be breaking other laws of the kingdom. And that's the problem. Is it right for him, is it wrong for him to have made the stone bread? No, but the moment he does that and submits to the devil's temptation, he will have broken some other laws of the kingdom. Can I have an amen? He chilled. No, I'm not going to live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Because there are other principles there. And if he had broken that, he will be demonstrating pride. He will be trying to tackle with the devil. And God doesn't want that. Do you understand? Hallelujah. Then the devil taking him up a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He showed him what? How many? All the kingdoms. All the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, all this authority I will give you. And they are and they are what? And they are what? And they are what? Is that the same glory that God we read in Psalm 2? You don't know. All this authority. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And then all this authority I will give you. And their glory. For this has been what? Delivered to me. And I give it to whomever I. Hallelujah. Is it the same glory we talked about in Psalm 2? I know you are intelligent people. Is it not? Is it not? It is. It is. The devil can give you contracts, genuine contracts like this. Two people, four people are fighting. Three are children of God. One is son of the devil. The children of God may not get the contract. And it's the side child of the devil that will get it. If he's ready to bow. The devil will walk. He can walk and kill so many people to make sure that he gets it as long as you bow. Is somebody here? All this authority I will give you and their glory. For it has been delivered to me. And I give it to whomever I wish. Next verse. Therefore, if you will what? Worship before me. All will be. How many? How many? All will be yours. The devil is a counterfeiter. Next verse. This is not the me my message. I'm just trying to show you some stuff. But I can't run away from revealing this to you. Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Did, did, did Jesus dispute the fact that it has been delivered to him? He didn't dispute it, because that is the truth. The, Adam, the first man, handed it over to him. Jesus did not dispute it. Glory to God. He didn't dispute it. Hallelujah. Listen, give me John 12, 30 and John 14, 31. 
Jesus said, the king, oh my God. Hallelujah. The king, the ruler of this world comes and he has nothing in me. John 12, 30. John 12, 30. And 14, 31. Hallelujah. The king or the ruler of this world comes and has nothing in me. Jesus confirmed what the devil was saying. John chapter 12, verse 30. 30. Thank God I have my Bible here. 31. Now is the judgment of this world. And now the ruler of this world will be what? Will be cast out. The ruler of this world. That was why he said, I will give it to whomever I wish. Give us John 14, 30. The ruler, the, Jesus acknowledged that the devil was the ruler of this world. That was before he went to the cross. I will not talk much longer with you, but the ruler of the world is coming. And he has nothing in me. Twice, Jesus confirmed Satan as the ruler of the world. Can I have an amen? Before he went to the cross. But the moment he went to the cross and he went down to the pit of hell, he collected the keys of death and hell and everything from the devil. Hallelujah. He took it over and he held it in. He's holding it in trust for you. Glory to God. Glory to God. So what am I saying? We thank God that Christ came to restore it back to us. But he put it all under Christ's authority for the benefit of the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Ephesians 1, 22, 23. New Living Translation. <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. God has put all things under the authority of Christ. And has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. He has put all things under the authority of Christ. All things that the devil was boasting about in Luke chapter 4. He says all things. And yours is ready to give it to you. Can I have an amen? First Corinthians 3, 21 to 23. First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 21 to 23. Between the natural man and the spiritual man. So don't boast about following a particular human leader. For everything belongs to what? To you. Whether Paul, Apollos, Peter, or the world, life and death, or the present and the future, everything belongs to you. And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. The caveat is, for as long as you belong to Christ, everything belongs to you. Can I have an amen? Can I have a bigger amen? Everything belongs to you, for as long as you belong to Christ. Whether it is human beings, whether it is death, whether it is life, whether it is the present or the future, everything belongs to you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So we've seen the spiritual man, how he was created in God's image as a representative of God, in his likeness, with similarities, as a model, as an example of God. And we have seen how he gave him dominion. Man lost that dominion, Christ came to restore it. And when he restored it, he put it under the charge of Christ. And for as long as you belong to Christ, all of these things are yours. Can I have an amen? Let's go back quickly to Genesis chapter 2. Let's see how that spirit man became wired to function upon the face of the earth. He started with Genesis 1, he created the spirit man. But when that man was going to function physically upon the earth, let's see how God wired him. Genesis chapter 2 from verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. He rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. 
because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. We see rest, rest, rest there. For those of you who are working and no rest, stop breaking the rule of God. God has put rest as part of work. When you walk, you rest. Can I have an amen? amen. There's a blessing in resting. Don't flout the laws of the kingdom. When you do, there are consequences. Your health will suffer for it. And it's not the devil. It's because you have broken the law of rest. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 4. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Look at verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Some translation says a living soul. Hallelujah. Then, verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden eastward, and there he put the man whom he had formed. He created man, the spirit man, in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, he wired that spirit man and gave him a body and a soul so that he can operate here upon the face of the earth. Glory to God. I said glory to God. So what is happening here? We have the spirit man, then the man became a living soul when he breathed into him. Hallelujah. Without that breath of God, that man that he formed of the dust of the earth will be useless and ineffective. But the spirit of God quickened him, gave him life, and he became a living soul. Can I have an amen? Amen. And this is where the dichotomy starts between the natural man and the spiritual man. Give me 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. We'll read from the Amplified. Between the natural man and the spiritual man, we trace the beginning how God created man in his image and in his likeness as his model, to, as his representative to exercise dominion upon the face of the earth over all the works of his creation. And we've seen it expressed and amplified in the psalmist, Psalm chapter 8. And now we see him becoming a living soul. And may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. That is, separate you from profane and vulgar things, make you pure and whole and undamaged, Consecrated to him, set apart for his purpose. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 24. Give me 24. Faithful is he who is calling you to himself and utterly trustworthy, and he also will do it. He will fulfill his call by hallowing and keeping you. Hallelujah. So we now see man, spirit, as was created in Genesis 1, soul and body in Genesis chapter 2. So man became spirit, soul, and body. He became a spirit that has a soul and is living in a physical container called body. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. I said praise God forevermore. Aren't you glad that you know your origin. Aren't you glad you are God's creature? Aren't you glad you are not just a living soul, but you are a spiritual man? Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Well, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, from verse 1 to 16. I won't be able to go into it because our time is well spent. Hallelujah. And there are six things or seven things that I will be showing you that is the difference between the natural man and the spiritual man. And that is the highlights of this message, of this first part. Hallelujah. 
Glory to God. Because there is the natural man and then there is the spiritual man. And the difference is the Holy Spirit. Can I have an amen? amen. That is the difference. Man became a living soul because God breathed into him. But what happened in Genesis chapter 3? In Genesis chapter 3, man that had become a living soul sinned. And when he sinned against God, what happened? God drove him out. His spirit became cut off as it were. His spirit became dulled. His spirit became separated from God, from the spirit of God. And then that man became a natural man, a living soul. Can I have an amen? amen. Can I have an amen? amen? And then all the consequences that happens. We'll see in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, from verse 1 to 16, what the consequences are as it's playing out today. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. There are seven things, seven major consequences. And I trust God that as he reveals himself to us, the Holy Spirit will help us to be able to appropriate that which is God's and that which he has freely given us in the name of Jesus. Let's rise up on our feet this morning. Mm -hmm.